All right, everyone, today you're here to talk about Greasy Lake, or as I call it, Good Boys Gone Bad, Gone Good Again. Um, here we have Associate Professor Phoebe. She'll be doing some entertaining dances throughout the day. And also just be snoozing because she seems to be Velcroed to me ever since I got home from school today. So it's been a, a long, lonely day at home for Phoebe. So just, you know, she'll be your entertainment for this hopefully not so boring lecture. Um, so to start off, uh, you know, you guys should have completed your reading for Greasy Lake as well as also, um, oops, you okay? As also, uh, as well as filling out a chart. So if you don't have that chart out, you know, please take that chart out. Um, if you do have that chart out, you're golden. Uh, so I thought I would show you guys some pictures of what teenagers in the 1960s looks like. Um, you know, you have to remember this story probably took place in that kind of awkward transition between um, the 50s and the 60s. We still kind of have like greaser style fashion. We have these women in beautiful dresses um, with the perfect hair and kind of, you know, red lip, very well put together. We have this great 60s hair. This is probably more later 60s, closer to like the 1970s, um, which is just, you know, like the helmet head, super hairspray. Um, and, you know, here's a picture of like what a, a high school dance would look like. So you have to remember, this was a very turbulent era, especially for teenagers. There was a lot of protests happening. Um, everything was still segregated um, for the most part. And so we had a lot of people trying to stand up for the rights of African Americans. And we also had a lot of people that were being jerks and were, you know, um, trying to inhibit equal rights for races and genders. Um, so it is a very exploratory era for a lot of people. Um, so it's kind of, I think, important to note uh, for the course of Greasy Lake. So uh, Spirit in the Night is a song by the famous Bruce Springsteen. And um, T.C. Boyle actually named his story Greasy Lake after um, the sort of journey that the boys take in the song Spirit in the Night, which is something that we listen to sometime. If not, you can totally listen to it on your own. Um, but much like the song in Greasy Lake, we have these teenage boys in the 60s who are bored while on summer vacation. I think it says in the, in the story, it's like their third day of summer vacation and they're already bored. And um, they decide to um, seek the intoxicating danger that surrounds Greasy Lake. And Greasy Lake is this place where um, we see some unsavory characters that uh, go partake in activities, whether it's hooking up or doing drugs or whatever. And so they decide to go down to the lake that night to seek the entertainment that they could not get in their own homes, um, in their safe part of town where they live. So if you guys have your chart out, I asked you to please create a blank of blank statement, not a thematic sentence, but an actual statement. And um, in this blank of blank form, um, I wanted you to read the story first and then decide on two thematic topics that would best, you know, two abstract words, I guess, that would best fulfill this. So. Um, for the sake of like my discussion today and the examples that I pull, as you can see, I have some of my um, my symbols over here uh, that I found very interesting. But I chose for mine the dangers of moral depravity, and hopefully you can see the the why, because I know my face is somewhere in that corner. Um, so uh, I chose the dangers of moral depravity because you have to remember these boys are coming probably from a very uh, you know tight laced uh, good family um, where they have manners and they have money um, and they are definitely not degenerates but here they choose to be degenerates and you know um, partake in some activities that are not the most uh, kosher um, to say the least. So uh, what I want to talk about first is and I'm going to do kind of a full example across the way and eventually I'll show you what I kind of mean or what you know we're looking for as an EP Lit team in these areas. So uh, first we're going to look at the cars and more specifically the narrator is Bel Air. Okay, um, so we have our bad character, um, who's the one that gets the tire iron to the head. I think his name is Bobby. Um, so he is driving a cool 1957 Chevy. Um, we don't know what type of car it is. I'm probably assuming it's some sort of muscle car. Um, it's metallic blue, which is like, you know, a daring color and in mint condition. So he clearly takes care of his vehicle. If you guys think back to like, you know, Greece and all those, you know, those movies where they, you know, caretake their cars really well. This is sort of falls within that time era. And then we have the dead man who I'm assuming is Al in this case. And, oh no, I'm so sorry. Um, who I'm assuming is Al and Al is, uh, he rides a motorcycle. So there's a motorcycle sitting there. It is a chopper and it's just kind of like chilling on the banks. Um, 
and we eventually, you know, our narrator finds the body. So I'm assuming that belongs to Al. But this is also kind of like the, uh, a vehicle of someone who is, you know, kind of bad to the bone, not, you know, someone who's like a mama's boy from the suburbs. Um, then we have the blonde men that arrive um, after their encounter with the fox, which is something that we'll talk about because it's absolutely horrible. But it does show a lot about this sort of moral depravity that the boys were falling into. They arrive in a Trans Am, which is this kind of like batter, like muscle car. Um, and I know batter is not a word, but you know, for the sake of this, shh, don't tell. Okay. And then um, the two women in the end, they arrive in a flashy silver Mustang with flame decals, which is like not my first choice of car, but also I'm not, you know, a drunk woman strung out on drugs in, you know, the 1960s. Um, so, and then we have, and I kind of added a separation here. We have, you know, the narrator and his friends and they arrive, uh, they roll up in, uh, their mother's, uh, Chevrolet Bel Air station wagon. So a station wagon is like a family car. And this kind of tells us a lot about our narrator and his friends. The fact that he's not financially independent, he's driving his mother's car, not his own. Um, we know he's probably young and naive. And I think that, you know, in the fact that he's not owning one of these fancy muscle cars or showing up in a silver Mustang with flame decals, he's not very daring or edgy. Um, he's going to learn real fast as I kind of have in my bottom uh, bullet point here that driving fast and looking bad, he thinks those are symbols of freedom, right? Everyone wants to rebel against their parents and kind of become the pers persona that maybe their parents might be embarrassed by, um, especially if you come from that tight laced idea of what it was be, you know, to be proper and well off. And um, so I think even though they're kind of rolling up to this greasy lake in the station wagon, it's like, you know, rolling up to, I don't know, a nightclub in a minivan. Like you, you might be going somewhere cool and edgy and you think you're like all that, but like, look at the vehicle that you're arriving in. And I think this is kind of symbolic of his integrity. The fact that his background, he comes from this like morally sound place where, you know, he's encouraged to, um, you know, be the best character, not a person who goes out and, you know, hits people over the head of tire irons and then tries to rape their girlfriends, um, which is what he eventually does. And so like when the bad character uh, awakens after being bludgeoned in the head and the blonde men destroy the Bel Air. So remember they're destroying it and he's in the lake and he's, you know, freaking out watching it happen. Um, I feel like this is representative of the destruction of their naivety. They finally understand the hard truth and the reality of what it is like to be a, you know, bad person or a rebel or someone who's edgy and cool. I mean, there's real danger that's involved in this. And I feel like they kind of have this romanticized notion of what it means to be bad to the bone and rebels. And um, they unfortunately face a really harsh reality that maybe their cushy lifestyles and innocence are the true freedoms, not this like fake air of decadence that they put on pretending to be someone who they are. And I mean, they really do some horrible things. Um, probably maybe even some things that are even worse than what our bad character would have done. I mean, he was just there hooking up with his girlfriend and instead they come in here, you know, and hit the guy over the head of the tire. And when he tries to, you know, get in a fight with them. So um, I think definitely it's, you know, very reflective of, of their current life. So I uh, threw up some pictures here for you so you guys could kind of take a look. So I'm assuming that like our bad character um, and his girlfriend were in something like this. So either like a pickup truck or this is a Corvette, um, something that's like sporty and, uh, you know, muscle car like. Um, down here is the Trans Am that the blonde men showed up in. This is the similar model to like, so you guys can see the body type. I don't know if this is you know, the exact one um, that T.C. Boyle was uh wanting for the story. And then I kind of have like a, uh, a 1960s like chopper here for you guys to look at. Um, so you can kind of understand what that looks like. And then I couldn't really find a, a silver with flames Mustang. Um, but this is a 1957 um, Mustang with flames, but it's a Hot Wheels. So, you know, at least you kind of understand what it would look like. Um, not again my first choice of vehicle but hey it's pretty flashy and then down here is like the station wagon the boys were arriving in so it's kind of like a family car um it's you know listed as like a sedan so it's not anything that is um you know too too muscly or kind of you know again it's like showing up in a minivan um it's definitely it's a family car but it's also a car that shows like a status symbol of some kind too it's it's you know implying it shows the background that they come from even though they're trying to show up somewhere and be someone who, who they are 
Um, so I uh, filled in this chart here, and again, I'll throw out my dangers of moral depravity. I uh, filled in this chart to kind of show what I was looking for in terms of um, symbol and, you know, an example of that. So if I was looking at, and again, I'm sorry if you guys are hearing barking and stuff, my windows are open. Um, so uh, the car is more specifically the narrator's Bel Air. I feel like in this case, we're looking at in your second category here, explanation, symbol, and give an example. Um, this is taken directly from the previous slide. So uh, this car in a way represents his youth and naivety. We see that juxtaposed against the muscle cars of the true bad people that are out there. And he thinks that he's cool and edgy, but he's arriving in a vehicle that literally represents his integrity and his morality um, and his background and where he comes from. And I think he's definitely ashamed in that. He doesn't want to be known as, you know, this person who's privileged. He wants to kind of take a tour on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, the biggest part of what we're looking for when you guys are analyzing is here in this last column, how does the symbol function to advance the theme? And um, what I want you guys analyzing for is like, for example, I'm gonna say when the men here destroy the Bel Air, it represents the destruction of his naivety. And I think they finally, the boys finally understand the repercussions of living an edgy, depraved life, right? This is what happens to you when you mess with the wrong people. And in a way they're kind of harshly thrust um, into this like really sickening reality where, you know, it's oozing with death and destruction and it's this sort of far cry from the comfortable life that they would have had if they chose to stick in the suburbs and, you know, the uh, comforts of their upper class lifestyle. Um, now for some more symbols, and I'm not going to go through all these. I'm going to talk about Greasy Lake as a whole here in a second, and then the keys as well, but I'm not going to fill out this portion. I feel like hopefully this is kind of a good idea that we're looking. I tie this back into the idea of moral depravity by describing how this, it creates this sickening reality, right? By juxtaposing those, the vehicles against one another. Um, so with Greasy Lake, uh, I put a quote in here and the symbol that I'm gonna to explain to you guys what it represents on the next slide, um, cause I didn't give myself much space. So he, uh, he states our narrator, I don't know how long I lay there, the bad breath of decay all around me, the primordial ooze subtly reconstituting itself to accommodate my upper thighs. Okay, and that's on page 135. Um, Greasy Lake is just kind of nasty. Um, we know the name, just automatically thinking about, I know we discussed the power of names in um, the 548 um, with Dent and, well, Blake, you know, but but Dent's name and everything. Greasy Lake in itself here, we know that water and literature, as you guys have read in, in Foster, it usually represents some sort of spirituality or transition, you know, when she comes up, it's baptism. But in this case, the water in Greasy Lake is actually greasy. It's polluted. It's literally filled with death and decay. And I think this, it's polluted in the sense that if we're looking at even the time era, this could be an overall symbol if we wanted to discuss it in this frame where it represents the murkiness of the time era or maybe the elusive badness that these teens crave so much, this lifestyle that is not a right lifestyle, but to them it's, it's the achievable one, it's what they want to become. Um, and I feel like Greasy Lake seems to change those who step into it. So we see like this is sort of, um, we're gonna talk about the hero's quest uh, in the next couple of weeks, but it, this is sort of his entrance into the danger zone um, where I'm sorry, I'm laughing for, if you guys have watched Archer, which is an inappropriate cartoon, but if you watch it, you'll, you'll understand danger zone. Um, this is where our, our narrator sort of wades deep into this lake and he, he's choosing to submerge himself in a lifestyle that is uncomfortable to him. I mean, he's talking about the, the muck pulling at his feet and he's trying to, to move, but he's trying to fall backwards, but it seems to suction his legs in. And we even see like um, in the quote how it's, you know, oozing around him and it's the breath of decay. I mean, it's not this like beautiful summer lake. It's this really kind of disgusting, um, oozy mess. And so, um, in a way he, as he's choosing to submerge himself into this lifestyle, he's actually saved by the dead body, which is kind of a weird thing to be saved by. It floats by, he falls into it and he understands this is what happens to people who submerge themselves in this lifestyle, right? This is this person, when they came up from their baptism, they, you know, came up in death. And so, um, 
I think eventually he decides to face his foolish and immoral ways. Um, he, instead of sitting there thinking, should he commit suicide? How should he explain the beat up car to his mom? Um, all these things, he understands the dead body is a sort of speed bump in his path where he's like, if he was to sur surpass that dead body, I mean, he could have become someone who would be unrecognizable to his current state, but instead he chooses to turn around and go back, which I think says a lot. Um, so in a way, Greasy Lake is, it still is kind of a form of baptism by wading into the lake, but I feel like it's kind of reversed in the fact where he does have some realization, but it's not positive, right? You know, he's um, born back into a life where he realizes that's a better fit for him than, you know, what he had, what he had thought before. Um, I also want to go back to look um, down here at the keys. And um, the second he drops the keys, and this is an important thing, and I know when I was speaking to some um, students yesterday that you guys were talking about the key, um, but the fact that the key, when it's lost, that's when he's immediately thrust into this really uncomfortable situation where um, he's getting, you know, beat up by the, uh, by the bad character. And so the quote that I picked for this was, and um, that lost and that the lost ignition key was my grail and my salvation. So it's kind of when he drops the key into the grass and he understands the weight of the situation. The key not only represents their only way out of this really bad situation, I mean, how else are they gonna drive away? Um, but it also is representative of the life that he leads and the life that you know he has. And so when he drops the keys in the grass, it's really this sort of uh, turn of events where he understands that you know, he's uh, submerging himself into kind of like a different sort of lifestyle. Um, I'd written down some things to share with you guys. So there's no way out. Um, ironically, when Dawn is arriving, they find the keys. So when we're talking about time of day and how that's important in literature, um, Dawn, the start of a new day, start of new knowledge, they are choosing to, um, you know, get out of there. Um, it's a new beginning for them and they all survive, right? No one dies in the lake, just the body of, we assume, is Al. Um, and he gets in the car and he starts the engine and he uh, magically finds those keys, right? Like way too fast um, for having losing them. And he said, there's no need to get philosophical about the keys. In other words, I think he recognizes the symbolic weight. Um, he now has keys to the vehicle that represents his lifestyle and his old ways of life. And this is in a way saving him now. So when he goes home, he understands now this cushy lifestyle that he lives is a lifestyle that's the proper one for him and not necessarily this kind of like tough exterior that he was trying to put on, um, when it came to him, uh, dealing with the bad character and the blonde men. Okay. Um, so not to, you know, cut short on time here. I'm sure you super love listening to me talk at length. Um, I figure I would show you guys some examples from my figurative language um, chart. I know in the upper right hand corner, uh, my face is probably covering this box. So I'll read it to you um, to show you this. But I, I wanted to kind of pick out three examples that I found in the text and explain to you at least one of them, um, how I how I feel about it. Um, so the first uh, piece of figurative language that I picked was a simile and um, he's describing right after he just used the tire iron to hit uh, the bad character and it says a single second as big as a zeppelin floated by and that's on page 133 and um, and I think in a way if you guys don't know what a zeppelin is it's kind of a big airship um, it's a really interesting thing I think to pick because zeppelins I mean still existed obviously in this time era, but in terms of them flying overhead, I mean, they were kind of used in like, nine, it was like 1918. I did some research because I'm not a historian. Um, but I think it's very interesting that they chose to pick a Zeppelin. A Zeppelin, if you guys imagine like the Goodyear blimp, it's kind of big, massive, you know, thing. So if it's passing overhead, it takes forever a year to get past you. And so um, I actually Googled the max speed of a Zeppelin, which is 84 miles per hour, which may seem fast, but you have to remember if it's up in the sky above you, that's going to take a long time to pass overhead. So I feel like by comparing the idea of a second, which we've had many seconds with, you know, going past um, with me just talking in this, right, it's it's this massive amount of time. And I think it shows sort of like the incredulity and the, and the weight that these actions have on 
on the boys, right? They they can't even believe what they've done. They possibly committed murder. They don't really know. Um, and time seems to stop. And it's just all of a sudden it's an alternate reality, but it's also very real. And it's kind of like uh, when you guys mess up real big and you see your life just like pause right before your eyes or – you know, if you say something you're not supposed to in front of your mother and she turns and gives you that look and all of a sudden it's just like slow motion. I got that a lot when I was younger. Um, I think that it's, you know, when we use a simile, remember that we are comparing two things using like or as. So the fact that we're comparing the passing of a second to the Zeppelin leads us to our function here, which is like, how does it advance the theme? Um, and I think in a way, like their moral depravity, like buds in this moment, this is where they kind of enter the dark threshold to this other, you know, almost like their alter egos in a way. Um, and time seems to stop as they transition. So I think, again, like Zeppelins, especially in the past, were used for militant reasons. They would drop bombs and stuff um, in World War One. I. I think this kind of idea of like a militant quality of the Zeppelins also just kind of ties into the violence that's ensued. If we're looking at the moral depravity um, entrance here. This is what's truly symbolic of, of how they've become what they've become. And again, I apologize. My, my voice is going out. Okay. So, um, we know similes again, they compare two things. I think this is a really powerful simile to use. Um, I included a second quote on here as well for imagery. Um, the water lapped at my waist as I looked out over the moon burnished ripples, the mats of algae that clung to the surface like scabs. Um, and I think this, and again, obviously this is, could be another simile. I just didn't want to use simile back to back, but I feel like the imagery in this is what's really powerful. And so if we're looking at this, if we're tying this back into the decay that Greasy Lake represents, if we're looking at how that somehow ties into the moral depravity of the boys and the dangers of that, um, the lake is being described as, you know, something that's scabby and infected and oozing. I mean, there's a lot of really negative words. We have a lot of negative diction to describe the images that are in this, in this lake. Um, and so I think it shows as he's, you know, submerging himself into this lake. I mean, it's, it's, it's filled with decay and things that are scabbing over and dead bodies eventually. Um, so this is a really powerful image to use. And then um, there is a lot of automatopoeia in this. In one part, he screams. That could have been another example. But I kind of liked this one, just the way um, we're going to talk about consonants and assonance um, when we get to uh, poetry a little bit more. But we have this ram, bam, bam across the parking lot past the chopper. And this is when they're running um, after the uh, blonde boys pull up in the Trans Am. And so ram, bam, bam, consonants is repetition of um, you know, uh, uh, consonant sounds in this. So we have the mm at the end. And then I think it's kind of like a harsh in the onomatopoeia. It's a harsh, like you can imagine if you imagine feet hitting, you know, the ground as they're running, it's very powerful. Ram, bam, bam. It's almost like slapping words. And so we can get the feeling and the emotion of the words through, um, you know, the, uh, the repetition of, of those sounds. So, um, this might be something that you could have written about. There's plenty in here. I mean, I actually had a hard time narrowing down, um, you know, some of the uh, some of the words in here. Um, I also hope that you guys notice that our narrator is also very well educated. Um, there's some words when I first read this story for the first time that I actually had to look up. So we know that he's, you know, coming from a um, a higher level. He is not cursing in this. And that's what we see as far as I was looking in, in the book on page 134. Um, when the fox is saying like, they tried to rape me, which is horrible. She's sobbing and the man's voice, a flat Midwestern accent, you sons of bitches will kill you. And so this kind of like, you know, a harshness in their, in their language and the curse words that they're saying, I mean, definitely sets them apart from these boys who haven't really cussed, but they did commit some really horrible acts. Um, and I know we talked about in my, in my, uh, third period yesterday too, as well, we're looking at, um, you know, maybe what caused them to go from beating this man in the head of the tire iron to all of a sudden they want to sexually assault this woman who had nothing to do with the situation. And it's sort of like they have become so depraved and so just like not themselves that all of a sudden that seems like the next rational thing to do because she had an ankle bracelet or a shiny ankle bracelet and shiny toes. I mean, and that's what it felt like they gave them the right to take advantage of her, which is, is not at all um, 
but I think it also just, yeah, it just proves like how quickly, um, you can become a, a truly immoral person just by, um, sampling a few, uh, of the, the decadencies that come with, you know, being this, this unsavory human being. I mean, it's, it's quite disgusting how they, how they acted. Um, so to kind of tie up our discussion, uh, I wanted to just kind of go over some of these things. So some like main things that we have in here is deception and teenage wannabes. We have how the boys are perceived versus who they really are. They want to come across as these kind of hardened criminal druggies, right? Going to this lake to, to party and indulge in whatever. Um, but the truth is that they can't escape their, their past and they don't want to. Um, so the water again is polluted. You know, once he's in the water, he decides he doesn't want to be this bad person. And in a way that kind of mirrors our our baptism. Um, I talked to you guys briefly about shifting morals and ideals in the 1960s. There's a lot of freedoms going on. There's a lot of, you know, protests, social unease. And I think these boys are trying to find their spot in a changing world that no longer represents just, you know, how they used to be. And um, socioeconomic status, that's what SES stands for. So the boys prefer to be primal because I think in a way they are ashamed of their affluent upbringings, um, much in ways that maybe some of these men and women that are down by the lake that don't have an affluent upbringing, they might be ashamed as well for how they're brought up. So um, they act primal and act completely different because they don't want to be known as you know who they were. And then at the end, I told you guys, we talked about some elevated diction. We can tell the speaker is educated. He doesn't speak in... Uh, slang or jargon or anything. Instead, we have, you know, very much, um, he's a very eloquent in the way that he speaks. He tells his story in a really beautiful way, um, truly helps us understand how disgusting the lake is and, you know, how he, uh, you know, gets taken, taken by it. And, you know, and at the end they drive home, um, you know, and he says, you know, at the end, I put the car in gear an inch forward with a groan, shaking off pellets of glass like an old dog shedding water after a bath, heaving over the ruts and its worn springs, creeping towards the highway. And then we have, you know, our beautiful ending. There is a sheen of the sun on the lake. I look back. The girl was still standing there watching us, her shoulders slumped and her hand outstretched. Um, and at the end, they end up denying a girl that they probably would have taken advantage of earlier in the night who's trying to get them to be devious, take drugs. She's drunk, right? She's looking for Al. Um, but instead, this is sort of them leaving that life. They realize this is not the life that we'll have or the life that we want to. Um, so hopefully you guys really enjoyed Greasy Lake. Um, if you have any more questions or anything, you can feel free to email me um, or, you know, come see me. Um, when I, when I come back. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is, this seems to be the fan favorite over the years. So hopefully, um, you guys enjoyed reading it and I look forward to discussing our next piece. All right.